Wow, well, what an honor the the Bighorn Sheep Center asked me to talk about what I've been working on. Um, yeah, I God, since I was a kid, I've been enamored with Bighorn Sheep, and find myself today talking to people about the work I've been doing is kind of a dream come true. Um, before I get started, um, you know, I know uh, Grand Teton Park. Uh, put out a post about this presentation. So there might be a lot of people here who aren't normally um, tuned in to this webinar series. And I just highly recommend if you have any interest in uh, wild sheep and even, you know, topics beyond that to uh, check out this webinar series. There's YouTube videos posted from the past, I think maybe two years from all the past ones. And then every month there's another speaker and I think Sarah put a link in the chat for anyone who's interested in, in doing that. Um, so I guess on to my talk. Um, you know, when I when I signed up to do this talk, I was expecting uh, that I'd pretty much already prepared the presentation in past years. Um, but a few weeks ago, we got our most recent lab results back. And it actually changed uh, the picture a little bit. So I've kind of had to recalibrate um, how I'm doing this presentation. Um, so I guess maybe a, a take home is, is at this point, I'm not going to have a lot of like um, conclusions to make. Um, I'm going to kind of focus on just telling the story of this project and you know, why we started doing it, what it's been like along the way, some of the challenges we faced, maybe some lessons learned. Um, and yeah, that's what it's going to be like. Um, so um, I'm going to start just by um, acknowledging the organizations that have funded this work. Um, we've been really lucky to have really solid local support. So the Grand Teton National Park Foundation has played a big role, Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation and the national chapter, uh, Iowa chapter of Federated um, Foundation for North American Wild Sheep. Is, I think they've actually adopted the Teton sheep herd and they've helped out a bunch. Um, Teton Conservation District, the Meg and Burt Rains Wildlife Fund and the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee have all made this possible. So thank you to all those organizations. And before I talk about our project, I just couldn't help myself but um, highlight how interesting scat can actually be. Like by definition, it's a waste product, but there is so much you can learn from it. Um, you can learn what animals eat and you can learn the quality of their diet. You can see what parasites and infections they're dealing with. You can measure their stress levels. You can tell if females are pregnant. And you know, in our application, you can get the animal's genetic information off of the sample and you can learn about the animal or the population it's a part of. Um, and I just think that's, I don't know, it's worth making a case for <laughs> how neat SCAD is. Uh, now um, I get to move into <clears throat> more about this study and uh, bighorn sheep in the Teton range. So I'd say, uh, Teton bighorn sheep are pretty elusive even to this day. Um, last summer, we had a volunteer on this study who's lived in Jackson Hole for 40 years. And up until last summer, still hadn't seen a bighorn in the Tetons. Um, so I think speaks a little bit to the, the areas they live in. Um, but what I wanted to <laughs> show is I thought it was entertaining was this excerpt from one of my favorite publications of all time. Um, it's from 1960. The, the publication is The Bighorn Sheep in the United States. It's past, present, and future. The author is Helmut Buchner, and I imagine um, a lot of people in the audience who are regular attendees have probably combed through this just like I have. And the Tetons actually have a short little section. Um, and uh, I'm going to read a little bit of it because I just think it's funny. This is what made it into a, a scientific publication. So the most recent report from Mount Hunt, which is one of our peaks in the Teton range, uh, was in 1954 when a trail crew saw four bighorn sheep. A few sheep have been seen at Buck Mountain and at various other points in the park where considerable favorable range is available. Winter observations of sheep within the park are sporadic and little is known about wintering areas. And there's a table at the end of this section, and they throw out a 
it's basically a guess of maybe 20 bighorn sheep in the Tetons at the time. Um, now that I'm sure that estimate is low. That's just, it goes to show how little people knew about these animals even into the 1960s. So the first real uh, rigorous effort to learn more about these animals was um, a master's thesis carried out by a Forest Service biologist named Michael Whitfield. Um, he did his field work in the late 70s and early 80s, and Michael's still active today, and he's actually volunteered on the study. And as best I can tell, Michael just lived in the Teton Range for six years, uh, figuring out everything he could about bighorn sheep there. Um, and it, it's pretty incredible the amount of just basic, but also previously not really known information he obtained. Um, but some, some take-homes that he discovered that we still talk about today are how many animals there were in the population. And he surmised there was about 125. Um, he also noticed that they, they seem to be split into two distinct populations, uh, one in the north and one in the south. And I'll make a side note to say uh, we're, we're quite certain that's not historically what it was like. Um, that's probably a, an artifact of losing so many sheep at the end of the 1800s. Um, and then the other thing he noticed is all the animals left are wintering at high elevation in the Tetons. So, you know, going back to this, this previous slide, um, if I can, you know, like no wonder they didn't know where the sheep were wintering. They're at the top of the mountains where people wouldn't really expect. Um, Okay, so um, you know, since Michael did that work, um, there's been some follow-up studies to kind of more precisely describe uh, how the sheep in the Tetons winter at high elevation, uh, more or less confirmed what he found there. Um, there's been genetic work that confirmed that there are two dis genetically distinct populations. Um, and now with this project, we're starting to uh, look at how many sheep are actually in the range try to get a better estimate of that. Okay, so um, the image that just popped up is a, a Google Earth image of the Teton range. Um, to make it fit on the slide better, it's rotated 90 degrees from what you probably expect. So north is to the right, uh, south is to the left, and we're, we're kind of looking across the Jackson Hole Valley. And um, these, these polygons I just popped up are, um, you know, approximate ranges of the of the different populations in Teton. So, and yellow is uh, the you know approximate core range of uh, the southern population, and then in blue is approximate core range of the northern population, and then um, the green in the middle is I, I find this area interesting because there are sheep there. It seems to be mostly rams at this point in time. Um, and it's not totally clear what population they belong to. I kind of suspect the northern. Um, but yeah, it's an area that, you know, there used to be a lot of you and lamb use as well. Um, and those animals just aren't there anymore. And so uh, now on the left, what just popped up is um, a picture of kind of like typical winter range for Teton sheep. Uh, this photo was taken from one of the recent helicopter surveys that Ellie Quartermanch with Game and Fish did. Um, and so you can see it's kind of these uh, small areas of like windswept ridges. So the wind blows the snow off um, so the animals can actually move around and then they can actually you know, have access to the ground where there's um, forage. So you can tell from this photo, there's not <laughs> very much forage here at all. Um, we suspect these animals get through winter by relying on um, the fat stores that they build up during the summer. Um, so this is where um, typically we have to count these animals. Uh, helicopter surveys in the winter is kind of the standard tool. Um, and you can imagine trying to fly a helicopter and count sheep at the top of mountain range uh, is a pretty hard task. Um, but that's what's been done for a long time. Um, the Tetons are really snowy and it's also very windy up there. So it's, it's hard to find times to, to do the, the surveys. 
And over the years, it, it hasn't consistently been a survey every year. Um, over the last, I think, eight years, Allie Cordemanch has done a really good job of doing regular surveys. And um, she started those, I think it was the winter 2014-2015. Um, but what we see here is kind of sporadic surveys from around 2000 to 2015. And then um, we have this like five year gap where there's no surveys. And then when the survey started again, there was three consecutive years where the counts were way lower than they were before. And when you're dealing with a population, like a small population like this, um, this is kind of when the fire alarms go off because I mean, 50 animals is not a lot. Um, we know not all the animals are seen in a survey, but um, you know that's a challenge with uh, you know aerial counts is you know that you're not seeing them all, but you don't know how many you're missing. You don't have like an explicit measure of um, the accuracy or precision of your survey. Um, and so at the time, following these three surveys, the, the biologists involved with the sheep herd were really concerned and you know, there's a few plausible um, things happening in the mountains um, that, that could have caused a, a population crash. One of them, um, Ali Cordeman should just uh, finished a master's thesis that found, uh, found evidence of winter recreation affecting these sheep. And, you know, it's obvious that that sport's growing really quickly. It's like, okay, so that's one thing that's possibly going on. Uh, there's also a newly established mountain goat population that was growing really fast. And so I guess my point here is um, we had these, these low survey counts, um, not totally clear at the time, you know, are the counts just um, missing a lot of the, the population or is there something really going on? But like, hey, we need to do something because we don't have a lot left to lose here. And it kind of looks like they're circling the drain. Um, and so this was also about the time I started working at Grand Teton and kind of from the beginning, um, my boss, who's Sarah Dewey, I might reference her uh, periodically throughout the talk, um, kind of one of my first tasks was to start thinking about um, a way to, to get a statistical estimate of how many sheep were in the range. Um, and so, yeah, I added this slide. So, <laughs> um, this project I'm gonna talk about, Sarah was one of the main instigators. Um, the other main instigator was Clint Epps, who Sarah referenced, um, Sarah Bridge, um, spoke here last month. And uh, we're lucky enough to have Clint come to town in 2019 as part of an expert panel to, to just kind of um, just give the, the local biologists some, some insight that we might not have, give us some advice. Just, help us figure out what we want to do with this small population of sheep. Um, and anyway, it was at that meeting that Clint said, hey, have you thought about picking up scat and getting DNA off of that? We've been doing that in the Mojave Desert. It's worked really well. Um, and by being honest, Sarah had actually <laughs> suggested that same thing several years before. Um, and I feel bad now because I kind of poo-pooed it. Uh, because I talked to one of the authors and they said, an author of a previous study, and they said it was a lot of work. Um, Clint assured us that, hey, this is working really well for us. Um, we're just going to some, in their case, watering holes, and we're picking up scat off the ground. It, it's not all that intensive. Um, it's working well. So that was kind of all we needed to, to hear to, to test it out. Um, and so these are just some, some publications that have used um, genetics from, from field collected scat samples to come up with abundance estimates. In some case, even you know, um, like survival rates. Um, and something that changed from when you know, I was reading these studies and when Clint talked to us is just how good the labs have gotten at being able to, to take a sample collected from the field and actually getting usable genetic material off of it. Because when these studies were done, um, they had to find the animals, watch them go number two, and then collect the samples. And that, that makes things really, um, the logistics of that are a lot harder. It's, it's hard to find animals. You're kind of working on their schedule instead of your own. 
But um, given where the, the labs have gotten to, when you can just go to a site where you know the animals are commonly there at your own schedule, that's a game changer and makes this actually like feasible if you don't have a big giant field crew. Um, and so, um, you know, the what we started thinking about as a way to um, kind of focus our efforts so we're not you know, blindly <laughs> looking for scat was um, wondering if we could just go to some mineral licks and pick up scat there. So um, for bighorn sheep, mineral licks are a really important part of their ecology. Um, and <clears throat> we happen to know about quite a few of them in the mountain range. That's what these little triangles are, are just some examples of, of mineral licks we know about. So like, hey, maybe we can go to just kind of a small number of sites, pick up scat, and um, expect that all the animals in the range are going to those sites. And fortunately, we actually had a way to test if that might actually be the case, um, because um, before I showed up here, there had been about 30 animals that had been GPS collared. So that gives you really fine scale information about where they're going. Um, and so I was able to basically take a map of our known mineral licks and then overlay all those animals' GPS locations on them and see if I could find a, a small set of mineral licks that everybody visited during the summertime when we would actually be able to be out doing this work. Um, and lo and behold, I mean, for the most part, they all visited one of, I think I originally picked out nine mineral licks. Um, you know, there's one you can see shows up, didn't, didn't visit during the, the summer months based on the GPS data. If I, um, you know, if I extended the timeline a little bit further, then, you know, she showed up a little bit later in the fall. So she was still using those areas too. Um, so this was great news because now we think we can get inference for the whole population. Uh, starting to, you know, like, um, I'm gonna try to say here, <laughs> uh, the actual scat collection component of this, like that you could say study design or methods are pretty simple. So at each of these mineral licks where we went to, and you'll eventually see a, a map showing them, um, we had a designated route that we walked every time. And it wasn't very long, like a hundred or 200 yards. And we'd walk and we'd look around for, uh, you know, scatterings or piles of pellets. And we'd pick up, you know, about 10 usually. And any that we didn't pick up, we would toss, toss down the mountain because we didn't want to pick them up the next time we came. Um, and um, we, we dried out the, the samples that we collected that weren't already dry um, from the sun as soon as we got back to the office using a drying oven. And this, um, this reminds me of an important point um, I meant to make earlier. So a lot of this work that's been done, um, getting genetic material off of scat, it's been done in drier places than the Teton range. You know, we're not a rainforest, but uh, we're also not a desert. And so it's uh, kind of an uncertainty going into this project was how successful we would be at getting, um, getting DNA off of the, the samples because uh, moisture does two things. Like the rain actually washes the DNA off and then the moisture um, degrades the, the DNA. So then when the lab's working with it, they, they can't really use it. Um, the Tetons get regular thunderstorms in the summertime. And then the other really challenging factor is that because our spots are pretty remote and we have a pretty small crew, we're not able to visit them say like every other day or even once a week. We're on like a once every two week schedule. So you know, our samples are also sitting on the ground potentially for, for quite a while before we're able to pick them up. Um, so that that's more opportunity for the samples to degrade. Um, so anyway, that was that was something we weren't sure about going into this study. Um, so now I have that aside taken care of. Um, the other thing is that we collected all the samples we found that weren't, you know, older than dirt. Um, but we didn't send samples that we um, suspected were from lambs to the lab. And that has to do with um, like assumptions of our, our population modeling. Um, and so, you know, all these inferences we're getting, it's, it should be 
yearling and older animals. Okay, so um, this might be a foolish endeavor on my part. I thought it could be interesting for people to um, like see a little bit more about how the, the genetic side of this like actually works, like kind of the nuts and bolts of things. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of helpful just to understand like, hey, how are we counting animals from, from SCAT? Um, so first I um, thought I could talk a little bit about what I'm calling the anatomy of DNA. So um, in mammals, um, our DNA is packaged into um, pairs of chromosomes. So humans, we have 23. I think bighorn sheep have 27 pairs of chromosomes. So each of the chromosomes, each of the two chromosomes in a pair, they have the same collection of hundreds or even thousands of genes. And um, in an oversimplified explanation, I'll say a gene provides information to determine like a specific trait about an individual animal. In the same gene on both of the chromosomes in a pair, so like, for example, maybe I'll point out this um, figure on the left here. Can you see my, my cursor? Yes. Okay. Um, so like what I'm circling here, like this is a pair of chromosomes. These are chromosome one. Um, um, so um, the same gene on both of the chromosomes in a pair, they're located in the same spot on the chromosome and they help determine the same trait type. So for example, that might be eye color. In reality, eye color is, is much more complicated than this. Um, but this doesn't mean that the genes are identical. So um, in like a, a population or a species of animals, there's numerous versions of a given gene and um, different versions allow for very variation in the physical trait that the gene helps determine. So for example, talking about eye color, different versions of the gene allow for different colored eyes. Once again, extremely simplified from reality. Um, there's something else I was gonna say there. Um, oh, well, I'm gonna have to let it go. Um, the other thing too, so the other part that's simplified is not all genes actually um, are, are associated with a trait. Some of them you might say are non-functional. Um, and those are actually the genes we tend to work with when we're doing uh, genetic studies. Oh, what I was going to say was that the different versions of the genes, um, they're called alleles. Okay, so um, with a little DNA anatomy out of the way, um, now I'm going to try to use that to help explain uh, what, what microsatellite markers are, because that's, uh, that's a tool that Clint Epps talked about last month here. And a lot of uh, wildlife studies uh, involve microsatellite work because it tends to be cheaper than some of the more intensive stuff. And so when we're doing work, looking at genetics of wildlife populations, we don't really need the whole genome to answer the questions we have. We can look at a relatively small number of sites. And so um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, this would be like a 10 marker microsatellite panel. And so um, we have a site here on you know, each pair from chromosome one. We have a site here from each pair from chromosome two, so on. But point is, uh, we're, we're looking at sites at 10 pairs of chromosomes, and then we have information from you know, each member of the pair. And this, um, when you start thinking about the fact that, um, you know, that there's multiple versions of the same gene within a, a chromosome, um, you can look at a small number of sites and there are many, many possible combinations of, um, you know, versions of these genes or alleles across, across your panel. In this case, you know, I'm looking at 10 sites in this schematic. And so um, this means that you can actually you know, start to discriminate unique individuals by just looking at a relatively small number of sites. And so I'm just gonna kind of simulate, like this might be one animal, um, and this would be you know, off on the right here, this collection of you know, types or alleles, this would be their, their genotype for our panel. And so here's the genotype from one animal, 
this might be a different animal with a few little differences. This might be a different animal, so on. And so this is more or less what it, what it comes down to. Um, but there's of course a possibility for errors with, with this approach, just like anything. And so I think the, the more intuitive error um, is the idea that you can have multiple individuals appear to be the same individual. Um, and so a, kind of the easiest example to think about is like, you might have identical twins. They, their whole genomes identical. That's also a simplification, <laughs> but um, you know, identical twins would look uh, the same on like a 10 panel microsatellite or sorry, 10 marker microsatellite panel. Um, but like um, close, close relatives also might show up the same. So like a, a parent and offspring share half of the genetic material, right? And so this is a type of error that um, geneticists can actually um, kind of calculate the, the probability that you'll see this in your population based on some you know, preliminary samples you send them at the beginning of the study. They look at what your um, genetic variability looks like. And for a certain you know, size microsatellite panel, they can tell you, hey, the probability that two, like a, you know, a parent offspring pair would show up the same is this. And so um, uh, the people we're working with at Oregon State, they did that for us here. Um, and so we go in knowing something about that error. Uh, the other type of error that can happen is kind of the converse. And that's that one individual can appear like it is numerous individuals. Um, and this, <clears throat> this is the result of uh, issues with sequencing the DNA. So um, you might have a, yeah, a less than perfect sample and it can lead to this. And I'm gonna try to explain how that happens. Um, and so this, this phenomenon is, that can lead to this, it's called a uh, Lelic dropout. Um, and I'm sorry, I need to move something real quick. Okay, um, it's called allelic dropout. And so um, when the geneticists are, are getting this information about, you know, like which, which allele, which alleles an individual has at a particular site, um, the method they use requires that, um, that the segment of um, DNA that they're looking at can be copied, like replicated many, 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 many times. And we need that from both chromosomes for a given site to, to get an accurate picture. But like these chromosomes are kind of independent from each other. So it's possible that, you know, hey, this chromosome on the left, it's in really good shape. Um, when we do our replication, we get what we need from there. We get an accurate indication of what um, allele is present. But maybe this paired chromosome right next to it happens to be in a little worse case, sorry. Um, or a little worse condition. Um, and so we actually don't get any information from that. It's a blank. Um, that's what this red box is kind of trying to highlight. Um, but the reality is, is the tools that the geneticists have, they don't get like a, this clear image um, like that, that this table shows. This table is kind of inferred. And the, the method that they use, what they would actually see if this happened would be, um, it would just assume that the second uh, chromosome for site three in this case, it had the same allele as the first. So now all of a sudden you have an animal who's same animal, but the genotype looks slightly different. Um, if you get, if you, the more sites you look at, um, the less of an issue this is because you can start to, um, you can see that, hey, like we looked at say 20 sites, 19 of the 20 sites, like, all the information matches between these two samples. One site says it's different, and then you can actually get at the, the probability of that happening. It's like, hey, that's highly unlikely. This is allelic dropout. This is the same individual. So this is the other type of error that can happen. Um, I promise I'm explaining this for a reason. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, we sent all of our samples to the, the EPS Population Conservation Genetics Lab at Oregon State. 
and uh, Rachel Crowhurst whoops, is Rachel Crowhurst is the the lab manager there, and she's incredible. And she's done all of our samples have been under her supervision, um, have been analyzed under her supervision. Um, and so, um, when we started the study, Rachel did some preliminary work um, and looking at the the factors I just talked about about um, you know potentially calling. Um, uh, not being able to distinguish between two individuals and then this allelic dropout. And Rachel was able to determine, hey, it looks like um, if we use nine, nine microsatellite markers for a Teton sheep, I think that's enough to tell between animals. And then we also have a sex marker. So we know if the sample's coming from a male or a female. And so to start with, when we send the samples to the lab, uh, we chose to to use this limited um, microsatellite panel because it's it's easier, it's cheaper. And we know that we're gonna get multiple samples from a lot of the animals. And we don't need like real precise information at this point um, from all the samples. We, we just wanna be able to tell animals apart. But then at the end of the study, um, we we pick one sample from most of the animals that we've identified, and then we have the lab extend that uh, microsatellite panel out to 16 sites. And so that gives us a whole bunch more power, um, not only to identify individuals, but also to ask questions about population structure, uh, uh, genetic diversity, connectivity between the, the two populations that we have connectivity with adjacent populations outside the Tetons. Um, so that was kind of our, our approach going into this. Um, and so now I get to actually talk about the field work, um, which started in 2019. Uh, we put this together in a real hurry. Um, and these these red triangles are the, the different sites that we visited. Um, so I think this is, yeah, nine sites that first year. And so we had a, just like every year, our program has two seasonal staff um, and we had them do basically these backpacking loops where uh, one week, for example, they might be in the Southern part of the range visiting these sites. They do that, deal with the samples. Next week, they go up to the northern range, and then they're repeating that five times throughout a summer. So we visited these sites five times spaced at two-week intervals um, from July to September. Um, so end of the season, we submit the samples to uh, Oregon State, and we wait for the lab results very eagerly. And in winter 2020, we got them um, from our first year and we were really, really excited from our, our first year results. Uh, the, the percent of samples that uh, produced DNA that the lab could work with was almost 90%. That was at least my main concern going into this project. Um, we submitted 300 samples to the lab. We collected quite a few more. Um, and from those 300 samples, that uh, nine microsatellite panel found 97 unique animals, um, which, yeah, that's that was great for us. And that's, you know, that's like our minimum. And we're collecting these data in a way that we can we can estimate detection probability, which then allows us to correct this minimum count to, you know, an actual population estimate. Um, that part to come later. Um, so I'll <clears throat> break the results down a little bit um, by the North and the South population. And of those 97, 57 were identified in our Northern herd and then 40 were in the Southern herd. Uh, but one thing I wanna point out, and I'll, I'll keep touching back on this as I go forward, is there's a, a decent percentage of animals whose sex couldn't be determined. So that means I, you know, I mentioned there was a sex marker on the, the microsatellite panel. So that, that marker didn't work for these samples. And this, this made it hard for us to uh, put the, the data into any preliminary population analysis um, because it, it matters. Um, you have to know more about um, 
the the sex of the the individuals to to do what we're doing at least in a rigorous way um but you'll see future years update uh past years data and okay so um i'm kind of going in a timeline here um as as i experienced this study so the next thing that happened after we got these lab results back was the the covid-19 pandemic began um and for this study, um, the reason I think it's it's worth uh, pointing out is um, it really impacted the lab a lot. I feel like it's kind of a miracle we were able to, to carry out the study throughout the pandemic. Um, so um, their their staffing levels um, were were really diminished, which meant uh, they had to work harder to get results, and it took longer um, to to work through all the samples that they were getting, not only from us, but all the other projects that they work on. Um, and <clears throat> fortunately, uh, the first year of the pandemic, we actually were able to have a, a staff here at Grand Teton. So we we're able to keep doing the field work. Um, and so I, I updated the, the sampling sites a little bit based on what we saw the first year, um, but same general uh, study design, visiting sites five times throughout the summer based at a two week interval um yeah most mostly accessed by backpacking trips but some of the sites are uh accessible on day trips so um i and some others were were filling in for these day trips okay so um october 2020 we send the samples to the lab and um you know we have a long wait for for the results to come back on account of the pandemic um, but in June of 2021, we, we get the results back. Um, so we submitted um, 517, or sorry, we submitted 393 samples of the 517 that we collected. And our uh, DNA extraction success went down a little bit. We're more like 80% the second year. Um, but the, the uh, microsatellite panel identified you know, almost 130 animals from those samples. Um, so we're still very excited. Um, and I'll break break those uh, counts down by the population and uh, sex again. Um, and so I'm showing the, the results from the first year and these unsexed animals, I'm pointing them out. So you can see when I do this, how the new results, um, um, helped clarify the sex of some of those animals. So um, what happened was we collected samples from those animals in 2020. Those samples were a little bit better quality and the, the sex marker worked in those cases. And then um, the other, all the other um, um, alleles lined up in our panel. So then we could tell, yeah, this is the same animal. So that means the sex is, it's a female. Um, so it's pretty cool how that, that works. Okay, so um, yeah, we got those results just before the 2021 field season, and that season was pretty much identical to the season before. Um, I don't think we changed the sites at all. Um, same setup, uh, July through September, sent the samples to the lab uh, in October. And at this point, we know we have a long wait, but I also have a, um, a pretty fun data set from the first two years of the study that I have a winner to start working with. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in studies like these, it it's, can be really valuable to, to take a preliminary look at your data because you wanna see how well you're achieving your goals and, you know, see like, hey, do we have to do something different to, to do better, um, stuff like that. And then, you know, you also wanna be able to report the, the value of what you're doing to the people who are, are helping you do it by providing funding. Um, and so at this point in time, it's, you know, these results are from the 2020 data set, but I'm actually coming up with them in, you know, like late winter 2022. So just, just a little over a year ago, um, like, oh, this is cool. Like 154 is our estimate for total sheep in the range in 2019. And 178 in 2020. Um, 
And so now um, I'm gonna kind of take a sidestep to um, add a little more context to like what else is happening with Teton sheep during this, this era, you might say. Um, so um, starting in the winter of 2020, um, the Teton Range Bighorn Sheep Working Group started engaging with the community to find approaches to, to try to secure winter habitat for this population um, as backcountry skiing increases in popularity and you know the, the regional population is also growing. So we're expecting to see a lot more backcountry recreation in sheep habitat in the Tetons. Um, we're trying to, yeah, uh, get the community on board to help us ensure that there's, there's secure habitat. And at the time we started this whole process, we thought that there were um, like less than 100 animals in the population. And during throughout this process, as we're carrying out this study, our, our thinking about how many sheep are in the range has, has evolved. Um, and <clears throat> part of this effort that we're, we're trying to um, do here, um, it, it just, it, absolutely depends on having trust from the public. And, you know, in 2020, 20, sorry, 2022, um, we have this preliminary data saying, we saying there might be 178 sheep in the population. Um, and um, we felt the need to be transparent with the community and sharing our, our current understanding. Um, so, um, we aired on the side of transparency and released preliminary results with the public. So the agencies put out a press release and um, it was kind of a good news story. Like there's, there's more than we thought there were. Um, so now I'm gonna step back to the, <laughs> the fecal DNA project. Um, so right after um, we released those, <clears throat> those preliminary findings, oh, sorry. Um, we we received our lab results from the the 2021 field season, um, and so a kind of a bummer from from those results was that our genotyping success declined to um, almost 60 percent. So we we think it had a lot to do with weather that that summer. the The second half was really wet with some severe storms. Um, so we were really looking to keep our uh, genotyping success up, but nevertheless, um, you know, the, the method still identified 104 unique animals from the samples we collected that year. Um, that's pretty good still. And then once again, um, just adding those results onto the, the previous years when we break it by uh, population, um, you see, <clears throat> you know, those, those, uh, unsexed animals, their, their sex was clarified. And we had less of an issue that final year because it's also relying on previous year's data to um, you know, help identify sex of some, some samples from that year. Um, so there were 51 animals identified in the Northern population, 53 in the South in 2021. Um, okay, so these results came in um, a month or so before we're starting field work and. 2022, which is our final year of uh, collecting data for this study. Um, so um, earlier in the talk, I made a point to, to mention how important it was that we had GPS data from collared animals to help um, demonstrate that these core sites that we are visiting, which are the red triangles, um, that, that those are probably visited by the whole population. Um, however, like if, if we're gonna publish this work, like that's not, that's not quite good enough. Um, so we also need to do some validation work the final year of the study. And um, we needed to collect samples from, from sites outside of our core areas. And <clears throat> um, the idea being, hey, if you, you collect samples from different areas, if there's animals that don't, use your study sites like you you should see like hey i'm only finding these animals at these periphery sites or i'll, I'll call them validation sites um so this added quite a bit of work i i added five sites for 2022 
the other thing I did was extend the, the number of visits. So we're actually visiting the site six times this year, which is really final year, given it are all um, trying to, to come up with as solid a data as we can. Um, and so to, to accomplish this extra work, we brought on a, you know, a volunteer group of seven volunteers. We, we'd had two in previous years. But so we had quite a few volunteers and our normal staff of two, and um, I was out there hiking around as well. Um, and then additionally, um, we, had, we had some opportunistic samples we were able to collect at some sites across the range. And, you know, just looking between the yellow triangle, which are our validation sites, and then these yellow circles, like, I feel like we covered the, the range pretty good. Um, just when, in terms of, or at least when you consider like what's actually practical to get to, and also considering, um, you know, like it, we want to go to places where we think we're actually going to get samples. Like we don't want to just pick a random spot and put all this effort in, not even get samples to, to validate. Um, so I think we did pretty good covering the whole range. Um, so those samples were submitted uh, October of last fall, and just a few weeks ago, we got the results back from the lab. Um, I was on vacation, so it's yeah, only been I don't know, a couple of weeks I've, I've had access to them. Um, and <clears throat> with the, the nine micro satellite marker panel, um, the, the lab found 123 animals in the samples we collected last year. Uh, what was disappointing was our DNA extraction success didn't increase. And we put in a really concerted effort last year to um, just make sure that we were, we were handling the samples properly, we were drying them out properly, we were diligent, and it didn't increase our extraction success. So that's like going forward, that's something I am, I'm really, uh, hoping to tease out and try to figure out what happened and why our success went down. It, it could be weather. I haven't had a chance to like look at the weather in a detailed way. Um, um, yeah, my, my gut feeling is I don't, I don't know if the weather was all that much wetter in 2022 than the first two years, but something, something I plan to look into. Um, but the curveball we were thrown was that um, in addition to analyzing the 2022 samples, uh, we also had our collaborators at Oregon State um, expand the microsatellite panel for most of the animals that we identified in the first three years of the study. So now we're getting back a, a data set instead of you know, nine markers, it's 16 markers. So it's a lot more powerful data. And the curveball was, um, Turns out there weren't as many unique animals as we thought. Um, so each year, the number of unique animals with the, the better panel was 10 to 20% fewer than the, the smaller panel had indicated. Um, so we just uh, gave the lab a list of um, animals to um, do the expanded panel on for the 2022 samples. So we don't, I don't know what that's going to come out at the end. I suspect it's going to be a similar reduction as the previous years. Um, so now hopefully um, my, my explanations about the anatomy of DNA will pay off uh, because um, what happened according uh, to the lab manager is we had higher rates of allelic dropout than um, and the lab has observed in other studies that they've done. So it's probably, uh, it's probably indicative of um, the sample quality that we're able to have given our constraints. Um, so, um, you know, this doesn't mean the study is botched or anything like that. You know, it's always part of the study plan that we're gonna look at this expanded uh, panel um, it just means, hey, it looks like maybe in this system, we need uh, a larger panel than nine to reliably identify individuals. Um, and, you know, I feel like it served a, a bit of a good lesson uh, when 
you know, working with preliminary data, interpreting preliminary data. We see it all the time in, in news releases and the media, um, you know, uh, sharing preliminary information. I feel like it, we kind of forget, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, like what it really means. Um, and so what it meant for us was we maybe put out some preliminary estimates that painted a rosier picture for the Teton herd than actually exists. I I don't think it's, you know, I don't think we're going to see like groundbreaking or earth shattering differences in the end. Um, but, you know, I, you, you, I think we all want to, like, when we have information, we're really eager to, to run with it. And um, I think this just serves as a lesson that it's good to be patient and uh, wait until, wait until you have final results. Um, and I'm, I'm someone who tries to find silver linings wherever I can. Um, so, you know, this is turning into a nuisance for me. Um, but I think it's a decent opportunity to share with a, you know, a decent group of people, like an example of, um, you know, how information related to, to science can, can change over time. Um, and, you know, I, I suspect there, when we reanalyze these, this data set with the, the better data, and um, I'm fairly confident we're gonna get a lower population estimate, you know, I, I imagine there might be some people who think that we're incompetent or even worse, maybe dishonest. Um, and so I, I hope that by <laughs> kind of showing you the intimate details of this, you can see how, how this stuff happens. Um, and as like scientists, as land managers, as wildlife managers, um, you know, we do have an obligation to, to share information with really everybody. Um, we're public servants. Um, but there's this trade-off between timeliness and, you know, making sure that you have uh, reliable information that you're sharing. And in this case, you know, we, we erred on the side of timeliness because we wanted to make sure we were transparent with our community. Um, I don't think that was a bad decision necessarily. Um, it just means that <laughs> we have some work to do um, to, um, you know, set the record straight with some of the preliminary findings. At this point, you know, I, I don't have uh, updated estimates. Uh, we just got the results back. And at this point, I'm, I'm gonna wait until we have a final data set to even start working with it. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple take homes in terms of abundance is where we're at at this point in time. Um, so, you know, I can say, uh, each year, we, we detected a minimum of about 90 to 100 animals using this method. I suspect in 2022, when we get the expanded panel data back, it's going to be similar. And certainly the population estimates will be above this. I'm not willing to speculate, you know, to what degree above at this point. Um, but all that said, um, there's still some interesting stuff to, to share with people. Um, at least I'm excited about it. So the first thing I wanted to share was what we found from uh, those validation sites that I, I mentioned uh, uh, several minutes ago. Um, so um, once again, we visited these sites because we wanted to see, we wanted confirmation that um, at our core sites, which are the red ones, seems like the, the whole population is visiting them. So um, these northern sites here that we visited, we identified seven unique animals up there, and all of those were picked up at a core site that we regularly visit every year. So that was good news. Um, this other site up north, uh, in the samples we collected, 14 unique animals were identified. Uh, 11 of those were detected at a core site. Um, Lee Canyon, Despite all of our efforts, uh, no animals were detected there. Um, this isn't really, yeah, this, this isn't like bad information or, yeah, it just kind of means we had some miserable hikes and don't have a lot to show for it. Um, at this site in the middle of the range, um, in the springtime, our, our summer staff um, spotted some sheep and then a few days later, went and found scat from those animals. From that, the lab identified one ram that ha hasn't been found anywhere else 
in the, the range in this study. Um, and uh, the northern extent for the southern population at Avalanche Canyon, two unique animals were identified there. And one of those was at a core site, which was you know, kind of a long ways away, though we're, we're aware of this movement. Um, and so those animals were picking up at core sites. And then way down south, um, south of Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, uh, six unique animals were identified in the samples from there. And three of those were detected at one of, one of our core sites. So overall, we detected 30 unique animals at these um, validation sites, and 22 of them were found at core sites. Um, so we know, like, we're not we're not identifying every animal at every site every year. Um, and so the fact that not all 30 animals were picked up at a core site, it, it doesn't mean that those animals weren't um, visiting those sites. Um, so like overall, I think these are pretty good um, statistics in terms of supporting our assertion that, hey, these core sites are, are giving us inference for the whole population. That's gonna be really helpful for publishing. Um, just some simple fun stats. Um, over the course of the study, we've identified over 200 unique animals. Um, I should point out, this isn't a minimum count. Like the number of animals over a four-year period is a lot different than how many animals are in a population in a given year, because every year there's uh, births and deaths, you know, changing who's, who's in the population. Um, there were 19 animals that we detected every single year of the study, though, though most we detected uh, far less than that. Um, I think this is interesting. Um, so there were five animals that we identified the first year of the study in 2019, and then we didn't see them again until 2022, the final year. Um, and the reason I think it's interesting is just, you know, if we hadn't done that final year, um, we would have, you know, we would have been left like not knowing, hey, were those animals alive or did they just die? Um, and so seeing that they could be in the population for for two years without us, uh, you know, seeing them, so to speak, um, that tells us a little bit about, you know, sightability and, and also survival. Like this this type of stat is kind of the, the crux or the core of some of the, the population modeling we're gonna be doing. Um, and then lastly, there's one um, interesting sheep I thought would be fun to share uh, kind of where we've found it. So this is the sheep's ID number 19221. It's a ram. And we first uh, collected a sample from him in September 2019, um, just close to Jackson Lake at one of our sites. Later that month, we picked up another sample from him at the park boundary, um, just up Canyon from the first spot. Um, the next summer in July, we picked up another sample from this guy down by Jackson Lake. Um, the fall, we picked up another sample from him in the same spot. And then a year later, in September 2021, we pick up a sample from him way in the middle of the range in this you know green area I talked about earlier, where it's mostly rams, and we're not totally sure you know which population um, they they belong to. Um, and then almost a year later, August of last year, we picked them up again back at Jackson Lake. Um, so, I mean, this is fun for me because we don't have a lot of, um, we haven't radio collared a lot of rams. Um, and so we, we know less about their movement patterns. And so it's just kind of interesting to see like the, the amount of the Teton range that this animal is, is clearly using. Um, and hopefully, yeah, others thought that was interesting too. Um, so next steps, as I said, we're done with collecting the data. So um, once we have the, the final, final raw data from the lab, uh, we can start working on the demographic analysis. Uh, we'll be looking to estimate uh, population abundance every year of the study. And then um, hopefully we'll be able to um, you know, use information across the years to actually estimate survival rates or uh, recruitment rates. Um, and then there's a whole genetic uh, assessment component of this project that um, you know haven't talked about at all. 
And so Clint Epps is going to be working on that pretty soon. Um, he's a bit wiser than I am, and he, he hasn't been working with the preliminary data. Um, so we really have nothing to share at this point for that. Um, but Clint's going to be looking at uh, connectivity between the two populations in the Tetons, the north and the south, uh, possible structure within those populations. Um, and then the other thing, um, so last summer with the help of uh, Game and Fish and uh, the Monteith shop at University of Wyoming, we were able to uh, get some genetic samples from bighorn sheep in some neighboring populations, uh, the, the Jackson herd across the valley, and then um, the southern end of the Absorcas. And so Clint's going to be looking um, to see what, you know, if looking for, for evidence of connectivity of the Teton range with those populations. So, um, you know, this, these same questions were asked 10 or 15 years ago, and the, the results were uh, the North and the South populations in the Tetons are genetically distinct, and there, there's no evidence for connectivity with the um, with the Jackson sheep herd across the valley. Um, and so if you listen to Clint's talk a month ago, he had a really good example of how things can change. Um, so we're just asking that question again. We don't necessarily have reason to think they've changed. Um, it's just good to keep asking because as Clint clearly showed, it, you never know when, when connectivity might arise. Um, and then ultimately we're, we're planning to publish all this work in peer reviewed journals. Um, so I can't uh, leave this talk without uh, expressing a lot of gratitude to all the people who put in a lot of really hard work to, to make all this come together. And uh, mostly I wanna thank the people that have, have done the field work and worked really hard. Um, so 2019, our crew was uh, Leah White and Jen Mikowski. Um, we were still figuring things out. They, they stuck with us through uncertain times. and. I'm sure it was frustrating at times. They did a great job. 2020, thank you, Josh and Hannah, for working during a really weird time. The pandemic was starting. Um, they did a great job. Thanks to Carly and Alejandra for enduring uh, what started out as a very hot, dry, and smoky summer, and then in a cruel way turned very quickly into a very cold and wet summer um, and they, they stuck through it all and came out uh, still smiling. And thanks to Hannah and Carly last year, um, we asked you to do more than we asked anyone else to do. Um, I had to hike further uh, more times. Um, it was a really tough season and they did it all with flying colors and very grateful for all the crews we've had. Um, we had two volunteers throughout the whole course of the study, Michael Whitfield and Ned Corcoran. They were incredibly reliable, uh, wonderful help, thanks to them. Uh, last year, uh, we had five more volunteers, um, and I just can't say enough about how great each and every one of these people were, um, and we could not have uh, accomplished our goals or even came close without the help of Ben, Dave, Pam, Robert, and Phil, so thanks to all of them. Um, I also really, I owe Ali Cordomanch a lot of gratitude uh, related to this project. Ali uh, helped make sure that we'd get samples from the neighboring populations. Ali's gone out several times to help collect samples. Um, Ali's helped us uh, secure funding for this project. Um, so, uh, oh, a, a great thank you to Ali as well. And a lot of other people too. We've had a lot of days where we need someone to step in and help us out. And we've, yeah, a dozen or more people who've, who've done that too. And I'm thankful for all of them. Um, and that is all I have uh, ending with this wonderful photo from one of our volunteers. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to field questions. Thank you, Carson. Um, thank you for sharing your, your work, your the research, the findings. Um, it's really incredible. And um, I should be proud of, of this and your presentation this evening. Thank you. Um, so with that, yeah, we'll definitely open it up for questions.
Um, let's see, let me change the screen so I can see all of us here. Perfect. Um, so for those on the line, Joe, I see that hand up. Yes. Hi, Carson. Awesome talk. Hi, Joe. Um, so could the reduction in the extraction of DNA be a lab issue and not a collection issue? Um, um, because, you know, the, um, it was, I think it was the 2020 year, right? Um, so the extraction success from 2020 was, it, it was lower than the first year, um, but it was better than the following two years. But then it rapidly declined. So yeah, that's when um, it was really hard to access um, materials. And so um, I wonder if they had to use other things that, or yeah yeah I mean uh, words but you know they may have had to substitute substrate or substitute something else that they hadn't used before so it may not have been exactly the same process that it had been the previous years yeah that's a good point um I doubt Rachel is on my suspicion is so so they're working on a lot of projects um I suspect if that was the case, they would have seen reductions across their projects and they they probably would have told us. That being said, I am um, my uh what they <laughs> my, my experience in a lab is uh um <laughs> nil. So I, I really don't um but well, maybe it's something I worth pursuing. Understand. And then um is there any are you, is there any possibility that there could have been a die off in the population or you're sure that the population has been stable and that your numbers are wrong for the numbers, you know? No. Uh, so what, what I haven't shared in this presentation were um, counts from helicopter surveys, the, the winners following uh -huh. or, um, you know, when we collected the samples. Right. And uh, so those counts were were pretty stable gotcha. uh, throughout this time. So yeah, they increased from 2019 to 2020 and then 2020 through 22, they were they were fairly consistent those years. So I, I don't think so. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, in the chat, Lois Wingerson. Do you always has a question? Hey, Carson, can you hear me? Yeah. Great presentation, fascinating. I think you could actually spin the fact that the population numbers are not as high as you first thought as an advantage with regard to the backcountry skiers, because of course, if the population is not so large, you need to protect it more. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, um, <laughs> I guess I, I view my job as just um, getting accurate information and, and sharing it. And I mean, I, it, that, where do I start? Um, so I suspect something that has happened as we release these preliminary findings that there were more sheep than, um, than we thought was people asking either just, themselves or out loud well hey if there's more sheep why do we why do we need to do anything it, it seems like something that um possibly happened or would have happened um so I'm sorry i'm kind of stammering here got a lot of <laughs> a lot of thoughts bubbling around um so i guess one thing i would say is just um like uh belief of mine is that, um, you know, these animals <laughs> deserve secure winter range, regardless of, of how many there are. Um, if you look across Wyoming, you know, it doesn't matter, say you're in Dubois, it doesn't matter if there's uh, more elk than normal in the, the badlands around Table Mountain. It's not like um, that wildlife habitat management area is like open to people, right? So I, I really, I hope we can get away from 
like tying whether or not we should provide um, secure winter range for these animals directly to, you know, year to year estimates of their abundance. Um, None, nonetheless, if somebody comes to you with that sort of criticism, you could come back with that sort of statement. Oops, it's not as great as we thought. Yeah, and I hope, I mean, yeah, I hope people are <laughs> realize that that is something that we've we've learned is yeah <laughs> well first we learned there were more than we thought and then now we've learned uh there's not quite as many as we we thought for a short period of time any other questions yeah carson uh it's beverly here um and good talk of course um are you going to continue with educational efforts uh, for people using the Tetons in the winter? And have you had any follow-up uh, with the skiers who want to go high and steep? Um, I did have one such skier tell me this winter that, um, the avalanche conditions were so unusual that it stopped people from going to a lot of the places that the recommendations uh, say don't go. So that might have been in the sheep's uh, interest, although um, sheep get into avalanches themselves. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, go ahead. Yeah, so short answer is, yeah, the, like, um, you know, uh, information sharing, collaboration, uh, education, it, we're, we're expecting all that to continue, not in the same way, the collaborative process, but um, yeah, and you know, I'm less involved with this part of things, but, uh, you know, like Sarah and Allie are, are working to um, just get informational material out to the public thinking about ways to kind of uh, broadcast information pretty widely. Have the ski guides been helpful in, uh, especially when they're in the Southern Tetons um, with uh, submitting sightings of sheep or anything like that, or giving their clients some information on sheep? Um, I can't really, I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that. Um, yeah, Allie or Sarah could have a little more information. I know we've, um, I know information has been passed to the working group uh, from guides. Yeah, I, I obviously don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're off the hook, Carson. What's being, yeah, I don't, I don't know everything that's being passed and not being passed, but we've definitely got, you know, information from, from people who are guides. Yeah. Thank you, Beverly. Next, I saw, saw Steve Kilpatrick with his hand up. Carson, a couple things I'd ask you to comment on. One is uh, the, when you're determining population numbers and doing it with your, your DNA sampling, and then you have a you have a range of animals, a confidence interval that <clears throat> you're pretty confident they're in that interval of 100 to 150 or whatever the interval may be. Versus, can you talk about that versus an aerial flight where you get one count, and therefore you did not have a confidence interval. So, if you could address that, and then also address, uh, I appreciate the rigor you've put into this uh, testing this technique. It's uh, I would think it's fairly expensive if you count manpower and all that, and that rigor needs to be done when testing a new technique for population estimates. But then comment secondly on the application of this to other herds uh, through maybe the state agency, and we we can't probably spend that amount of uh, investment within determining a population number that you have here, but the rigor is necessary. Yeah to understand the pros and cons of your methodology. So two, th two questions. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, how, how does um, what we're trying to do in terms of we're trying to get an estimate and we're trying to get a measure of precision around it. Um, Steve's asking, how is that different from what we get in a helicopter survey? Um, so um, maybe I'll, uh, a requirement to, in order to um, get a, a measure of precision around any estimate of really anything is you have to do multiple measurements. Um, and so in our case, you know, our multiple measurements with our fecal DNA project is we're, we're visiting these sites five times across the summer. Um, so we're looking multiple times and how many times we find these animals on average across those visits is what gives us the, the core information of, of how many we might be missing. Um, so a helicopter survey, um, it, it's one, one count and um, there's no data to, to say much of anything about, you know, how many animals you might be missing. So, um, you know, a lot of it is just, and not to say there's not merit to this, but, you know, I think there's like gut feel. It's like, this was a good survey. The conditions were good. You know, there was fresh snow. There were tracks we could find and follow. Um, that's not really something you can quantify, right? Um, and so when you, um, when you have like a, a time series or a series of population counts from a helicopter or any other, you know, platform you want to use, um, when the numbers change across years, you don't have a, a formal way of determining if those, the difference in animals counted is because there's actually less animals or because um, because you saw a lower percentage of the population. And there are some populations where, I mean, it's just like every year, uh, the counts are so consistent, you know, that you, you trust that, that you're getting a good idea of, you know, the, the trend there. Um, something like the Tetons, it, it's just such a challenging survey, I think there's a lot of um, variability in the counts and it's hard for us to, to know um, if that variability is because a lower percentage of the herd was observed or something's actually happening. Um, yeah, okay, uh, second part, uh, applicability for other, <clears throat> like other populations. And was there, um, I feel like you may have asked for a little more specific, Steve. No, it's more, it, Carson, just a gut feeling. What's, yeah. what's going to be the realistic application of this to larger herds, other herds that you're you're familiar with? Maybe Clinton Epps is already doing it. I, I don't know, but just inform the audience. Yeah. Um, so Clint Epps has worked, I believe, with a variety of, of different types of populations, not necessarily in Wyoming. Um, so I think this method is well suited for smaller populations. Um, I think larger populations, it wouldn't do as well. Um, you're, you're sampling a lower percentage of the population with a given sample size. And um, almost by definition, that means your detection probability is going to be low. And low detection probability means low precision. Um, so I think it's something uh, easier suited to small populations. Uh, that being said, um, you know there are different approaches you can use for for bigger populations or or even instances where um, kind of like maybe you can't confirm the whole population can be found at a few sites, and so you can get into doing kind of more of a random selection approach for your study sites. And so you select a, a random assortment of sites. And then you, when you do that, you have to extrapolate your, your findings across the whole area that you think the population inhabits. And um, my, I haven't done that work um, myself. Having read papers about it, it seems to me when you have to go that route, you have to invest a lot more effort and um, it's harder to get high precision is what I think I've seen um, in other applications. Um, 
I, I hate to dissuade someone from that if I'm, <laughs> if I'm off base there, because once again, I, I haven't actually uh, been a part of that type of study. Um, the other thing I might add is I feel like a big, big part of why we were able to do what we did was because we had a lot of work had been done on this population before we started this study. Um, and, you know, of particular value was all that GPS collar data that allowed us to pick our sites in an informed way. Um, I could imagine if you are working with a population that you you don't have that type of information, you you might be a little more blind trying to to pick sites that you're going to uh, you're going to monitor. Um, yeah, so I um, so we use mineral licks, right? That was our attractant here. Um, drier areas, water sources seem to be pretty reliable, and maybe even more reliable. Um, it's probably a more essential need on the animals. So, you know, I I can imagine, you know, if you're working with a population in a drier place, uh, you might have pretty good success focusing on water holes. I don't know if that's really the case anywhere in Wyoming. Um, um, yeah, that's the best I can do. Very good. One thing for anyone else asks a question. Um, so something I am going to do is I'm going to take our data set and kind of do these simulations where I, I take subsets of the data and reanalyze it. And I'm what you can do after doing that is you can start to see like kind of like trade-offs between like not not submitting as many samples and like how much precision do you lose mm -hmm. because um, we might be submitting a lot of um, samples that actually aren't doing us much good. Um, I won't really go into detail on that, but um, I am going to do a simulation to see like how much we could pare back our sampling in terms of samples we send to the lab and and still get you know comparable measures of precision thank you carson and before we get to a question in the chat let's go to patrick neary his hand up hey pat hi carson uh, my question would be related to uh, fecal sampling and what else we may be able to learn from fecal sampling and I have no knowledge of DNA whatsoever, so uh, uh, excuse my ignorance, but um, what else could we learn uh, from fecal sampling in terms of the health of the herd or disease transmission or anything else? Uh, where, where could this go, not just for this species, but for other species as well? Um, yeah, so, um, and you're... And you're asking about just uh, information from fecal samples in general, not just genetic based information. Correct. Yeah. So there's a lot. And I, I have to think it's just going to increase over time. Um, so like if um, for people who are regular uh, viewers of this webinar two months ago, um, Pete from uh, Wild Dog or what is it? Um, <laughs> Working, working dogs, dogs. <laughs> yeah for conservation um so they're training dogs to smell sheep's bighorn sheep scat and um determine infection status for mycoplasma over pneumonia so that's one like pretty exciting example um and you know i think we all at following covid like we know that for humans like we're using um basically fecal <laughs> information to uh, learn about, you know, whether or not, or we're learning about COVID transmission in human communities. I imagine it, it could, there could be similar potentials for wildlife applications as well. Um, on the diet side of things, um, historically it's, it's been um, uh, challenging to accurately estimate animals diet from their, their scat because um, the, the forage that is best for them is digested the most and shows up like disproportionately low in their, their, um, scat. 
Um, I think there's a, a new technique that I believe is giving a better indication of um, animals' diets. It's called uh, metabarcoding. And so I believe that approach, it's looking, it's looking at genetic material of the plants inside the scat. Um, and we're actually planning to use that with a, a study we're going to start here in the near future. Um, for a long time, um, biologists have been looking at scat to, to look at parasite loads. Like for, for bighorn sheep, um, you know, there's obviously like the intestinal parasites, but you can even learn about uh, things like lungworms end up, you know, getting passed out the digestive tract. Um, uh, something I think might be on the horizon that would be really interesting. So um, I, I am not a, yeah, I, I don't know lab work at all. Um, but um, like with the progesterone, that's the, like the pregnancy hormone. Um, you know, you can, you can pick that up in animals, uh, scat. And so people for quite a while have been using progesterone to to figure out if animals are pregnant or not. And I, my understanding is it's like a pretty finicky approach. I think, I think there's a lot of caveats and stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I have to wonder, so that hormone is showing up in scat, like there must be others too. And one in particular I wonder about is like hormones related to lactating. Um, so, and I'd be really excited if, uh, down the road, it turns out that really smart people can take scat and tell if the, the animal was lactating. Um, because that's like a, you know, a step in addition to just knowing if they're pregnant. It's like, okay, they were pregnant and they, they carried an a offspring to a certain point, you know, in its upbringing. Um, I think that would be really cool if that came to fruition. Carson, what about micronutrients and uh, trace minerals? Ooh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I know people look at like nitrogen levels as a, some indicator of the quality of their diet, um, but that that's all I'm aware of. And any stress hormones you can pick up in scat? Yep. Yep. You can pick up stress hormones. Um, that's another one. I don't, I couldn't tell you what, I'm sure people have gripes with it. Um, <laughs> um, but I know people have used it to, to measure stress. Carson, um, Pat, this is Mark Hitchberger. Um, in 1999 and 2000, the Whiskey Mountain Big Orange Sheep Technical Committee used uh, pellets and progesterone to estimate pregnancy rates in the herd. So just to share that information, we found well, our concern: what were they? Were we losing young young lambs, or were they not being born, or were they not getting pregnant? And we found about ninety eight percent of the samples that we got from females, because we actually watched the sheep. Um, defecate and collect them from the animals. So we got them from ewes and we found about 98% of the ewes were pregnant. So, but there was, so, yeah. it's a, it's a, like you said, it's kind of a tenuous situation though. But overall you'd say it, it worked. Yeah. One of my, one of my first jobs, um, my my boss was doing his master's degree on on bison on the bison range and it was a similar question um their their uh, calf recruitment dropped a whole bunch in a short period of time and so they were just trying to figure out when in the the biological year that loss was happening and so we were out collecting scat from known animals that we knew were pregnant from ultrasounding um and at it seemed like it worked well in that that project as well. Um, Carson, one question in the chat um, from Scott Cooper. 
can you please speak about inbreeding and genetic diversity with regard to the herds remaining separate? Wouldn't it be advantageous for them to intermingle? Yeah, and um, just to, to clarify, this is um, the, the two populations in the Teton range we're talking about. That's how I understand it. Yeah. Yep, or he okay. said- Because that's, yeah. that's a lot different, um, <laughs> it's a lot different uh, situation than uh, connectivity with uh, neighboring populations. Um, so um, Or the Jackson herd. Okay, so yeah, Jackson herd, would, there would be big concerns there. Um, I think within the Teton range, um, I think, yeah, connectivity between those populations would be a good thing. Um, it's really interesting, and you, know, you, you can't really argue with the, the data, uh, but just looking at the distribution of sheep, it's, it's really interesting that there is that genetic distinction because you know, as I, I showed from one of those rams, like the, the northern animals are moving quite a ways south. It, you just have to think there's something, some um, genetic exchange happening that way. Um, so we'll see what Clint comes up with. Um, I think that would be a good thing. We don't, yeah, um, we don't necessarily know that the genetic uh, situation is dire enough uh, for the Teton herd that you know it's it's having a severe impact on them at this point, and that's something we've talked to Clint about a little bit. And he's he's made a point to say it's it's pretty hard to you know look at measures of um, you know genetic diversity or inbreeding and like directly equate that with some consequence in terms of characteristics. Um, so anyway, we'll see what <laughs> see what Clint comes up with. Um, so uh, from a genetic standpoint, it would be it would be really good to have connectivity with other populations. Um, the The problem that we face with the Teton sheep, and this is, I mean, I would say this is like the the biggest challenge for for bighorn sheep management in general is managing genetic connectivity and balancing that with risk of uh, pathogen transmission with pneumonia. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to get genes from another population without getting their pathogens too. Um, and it's kind of tongue in cheek there. I don't, we don't really know how those probabilities play off. But if you're getting, if you're getting genetics from a population, that means you're also exposed to that population and their pathogens. And, um, something that's somewhat unique about the Teton range sheep, at least within this region, like the, the greater Yellowstone, is that um, we haven't found mycoplasma of pneumonia in them yet. And we have in all of the um, neighboring populations. And so including the Jackson herd. Um, so um, it, it just, um, there, there's a big risk, risk there. Um, you know, you have to think if if our sheep are exposed to a a novel strain of mycoplasma, that there's going to be a, a consequence and a die off. And um, you're really, <laughs> I mean, you're really rolling the dice. Uh, sometimes populations recover, um, like the Jackson herd does. Um, you lose half of your animals, which in the Teton range would be really bad because we don't have that many to start with. But anyway, where I was going, you know, sometimes the populations recover. Sometimes you end up like whiskey, um, or you know, if people follow other states. The Highlands population in Montana, um, twenty years later, they they can't. They're they're struggling to recruit lambs, and um, that would be catastrophic for the Teton Range. So at this point in time, that's that's not really something we're looking to encourage uh, genetic connectivity with the Jackson herd. I mean, God, if I'm if I'm optimistic, there might be a day where we know more than we do now, where we can like kind of manage those risks and uh, try to try to improve our genetic connectivity, um, try some creative things maybe. Um, but yeah, for the time being, that's that's not something we're interested in facilitating.
Carson, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, the recent captures by the Monteith crew and then the Jackson captures, I don't remember the sample size, but uh, pregnancy rates, the lowest, at least I've heard of, and I don't keep up in the literature like you, but around 50% pregnancy rate in the Jackson herd this year. For those in the audience, it's usually 80 and above, usually close to 90. So here we have a herd that's had a couple of uh, die-offs, you know, kind of bouncing back, doing pretty darn well. And then why, why would we have ewes that aren't pregnant? I mean, I I'm not asking you that, Carson. I'm asking mm -hmm. it, the greater, uh, yeah, the greater, the greater scientists in the whole sheep world. I mean, that's just unheard of of that low of pregnancy rates in a rebounding herd. Anyway, it's weird. We we just have more questions as we find out more answers. You know, Steve, I have some recollection of this isn't a publication, but I feel like a, maybe a data set of the from the Jackson herd where I, God, I swear I've seen statistics from a year, you know, maybe 10 or more years ago where pregnancy in the Jackson herd was really low. Hmm. I'd be curious to, to confirm that and see like uh, timeline wise, how that lines up with, you know, just the, the population cycles and then the, the die off cycles as well. Anyway, you might contact, uh, you know, uh, Brittany, I guess, was the one that told me and Rachel and then pick their brain a little more. But I think. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Joe. So it was brought to my attention that I threw the lab under the bus and that was not my intention. <laughs> um, think things that changed possibly if they changed lab supplies might not have even been on their radar. And even inactive ingredients in medications or supplies can have an outcome on how things are processed. So do you think, would you expect that same decline to happen on all of their projects that they were working on? I think it depends. I mean, how many other sheep projects were they working on? I'm not sure. It wasn't just sheep. Yeah, you know, they work on other. I mean, onions, so too. I don't know if the extraction technique is exactly the same or not. Yeah. And I'll stand by uh, <laughs> uh, Rachel and Clint. Uh, they've been, yeah, right, uh, right. So really I, good to work with. Yeah, and right, right, um, right. It, it's not, it's not like a, I, I suspect you might be envisioning kind of like a fee for service situation yeah. where we don't have much of a relationship. We we really are collaborating with them. Right. And with no, I, 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 that was brought to my attention. So, <laughs> but but again, things may change that change. Yeah outcomes and if they're looking at yours and then looking at somebody else's and looking at somebody else's they may not be looking at it across but yeah that's that's that. a great point and i'll um okay. next time no, I'm, I'm, now I'm, I'm throwing people under the bus <laughs> 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 and again thank you very much and i enjoyed the question and answers as well and carson this is a seems like a quick one um how large is the study area north to south i think you mentioned that early on um, the, the Tetons are about 40 miles north to south and about 10 miles across, roughly. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carson. I'm pleased to have you with us tonight. Um, before we go, I'd like to ask anybody who's in, ask everybody who hasn't shared their email uh, with me this evening to to email it to the chat or to me directly, just so we can put you on our mailing list and you can be um, on, a, on our mailing list for this recording and future webinars. I'd like to direct everybody to our website. Um, I will put the link in the chat right now. All of the Wild Sheep webinars are recorded and uploaded on our website. So bighorn.org slash wild sheep webinar series recordings are there. Um, before we go for the evening, I'd like to invite you all who are locally based in Dubois to join us for a few programs we have up and coming. Uh, on Thursday, April 20th, we will be having a screening of transmission. Um, the transmission film is about mycoplasma, ovenemonia, and 
how producers are working with wild sheep researchers and scientists um, to stop the spread. So please see it. So please come to the National Bighorn Sheep Center, 12 p.m. on April Thursday, April 20th, if you'd like to see that. It's also available on YouTube. You can visit our website for the link. The, the following Thursday, April 27th, we will be hosting Jackie Clancier from Central Wyoming College for a screening of Glacier of the Winds. She will be at the National Bighorn Sheep Center in person. And really um, a key presentation that we have that I'd like to invite you all to, this will be a recorded, it will be live streamed and it will also be in person. It will be on Monday, May 1st, and it's a community, community education session about the transmission risks from domestic sheep and goats to wild sheep. We will be hosting the Rocky Crate Chair, Dr. Kate Hybert, in person in Dubois. We'll be speaking about those risks. We'll also be joined by Game and Fish, um, the US Forest Service, to speak about what about the Shoshone National Forest and various bands in certain areas for, for domestic goats. Please join us that day, tune in. Um, we hope to have an informative education session. Um, with that, I will thank you all for joining us tonight. Please stay tuned for more webinars and we appreciate you Carson and everyone else who made tonight possible. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. <laughs>